Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Stephanie Stoller from Mount St. Joseph University and uh, our higher ed group called Stars in Higher Ed, Stronger Together, the Alliance for Reading Science in Higher Ed, uh, has convened this opportunity today with the help of the Center for Reading Science at Mount St. Joseph University to learn a little bit about an app that Nancy Everhart and Cheryl Forlito have created uh, called Sortigories. And I think Sortigories has some really nice application in higher ed. And so I've asked them to give you all an overview and a little demonstration of what the app can do with children so that you can get your wheels spinning about how this tool might be applied in the work that you're doing in higher ed. So um, thanks again for being here. And a special thanks to Nancy and Cheryl for sharing their really wonderful tool with us. I just really appreciate the perspective that these two ladies have on word knowledge. They're gonna explain that to you a little bit and uh, practice and how important that is. And so uh, this tool really is coming at structured literacy from both of those perspectives. So welcome Nancy and Cheryl and uh, take it away. The floor is yours. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and thank you, Stephanie, for this opportunity. Okay. Thank you for being here. Can you see that? Yep, you're. it looks yeah. great. Okay, <laughs> that's a good starting point. All right, go ahead, Cheryl. Great. So Nancy and I came together years ago when we um, created Sortigories for Voyager SOPRIS Learning. It was part of a much larger product uh, called the Language Curriculum for Older Students. It's back in the market um, and um, self-published by Nancy and me. So we're excited to bring the third edition out with some improvements and uh, applicability to younger students. And more recently, we're learning to adults who are learning the science of reading. So that will be the conversation we'll have today. We want to talk more, talk with you about how sortigories might be used to help teachers and ad adults learn more about how to teach reading. So we're going to talk about what is sortigories, how does um, how do we use meaningful practice in decoding vocabulary and syntax? Really important that the science of reading doesn't get stuck in that decoding lane. And then how might sortigories in uh, enhance courses or practicum with teachers in training. So really important topics here. So first let's start with the basics about what is Sortigories. I shared a little bit with you about its history. Um, it is a web-based tool used on any device 24 seven uh, for emergent readers um, and learners who lack accuracy and fluency. Um, it can be used uh, on tablets, desktops, you know, wherever you can get the internet, basically. It provides extensive vocabulary practice while learning the code. So when, after we teach the introduce the code, then we use the same scope and sequence for phonics to um, talk uh, introduce vocabulary. Uh, it provides corrective feedback. So the corrective feedback is on correct and incorrect answers. That's one of the big revisions of the third edition. Also has built-in supports. And this is really where um, it helps not only the students, but the teachers understand and learn the science of reading. They might click on the glossary. They might click on any of the help concepts that will talk to them about some grammar concepts or morphology concepts or even syllable types, it could be, it ranges. Purposeful practice is really important for us. Like um, we want students to reach masteries. We don't want kids to just have busy work. We want kids to have practice that is very systematic and designed to reach mastery. So we'll talk to you about how Sortigories provides that. And as we move on, um... Just want to make a comment. Since we're a small group, if anyone has a question along the way, please um, interrupt us, not interrupt, but drop it in the chat or raise your hand because we certainly would like to respond to what might be of interest to you. Um, so 
Sortigories, uh, based on what Cheryl was just saying, uh, was designed to address the goal of differentiation, namely to be able to deliver the appropriate type and amount of practice to achieve mastery. And I had the pleasure of over the course of this last year to work with Stephanie on the upcoming issue of perspectives on language and uh, literacy from uh, the IDA organization, International Dyslexia Association, and Stephanie designed what I think is the perfect graphic. So we thought we'd listen to Stephanie tell us about this graphic that sort of sets the stage for why we think Sortigories is an important tool. Hi there, this is Stephanie Stoller. I uh, wanted to speak to the infographic that you see on the slide here. This really came from reading an article by Sharon Vaughn and Jack Fletcher that was published by AFT in 2020. They articulated the idea that the lack of fluency in text creates a bottleneck that sends students into a negative cycle that you see at the bottom of this uh, graphic. We know that students who spend time reading learn new vocabulary through reading, they learn new content, they increase their fluency, they even improve their reading comprehension, all the good stuff that we want. But students who aren't fluent in text don't get access to that good stuff. If your reading is slow and effortful, you spend less time reading, you learn less new vocabulary and content knowledge, you understand less of what you read, so reading is less enjoyable for you, therefore you spend less time doing it, and the negative cycle repeats itself. Differentiated instruction and practice can break this cycle. So that's what's depicted at the top of this graphic. We know that reading comprehension depends on effortless, automatic, and fluent reading. The way to move students from reading accurately to reading fluently is through practice. And this depends on teachers having good assessment data that helps them differentiate where are students in this sequence from accurate reading to fluent reading to reading comprehension. Students will demonstrate to you in a variety of ways which stage of this learning hierarchy are they in. So teachers can use that assessment data to differentiate their instruction and match their instruction to where students are on this instructional hierarchy so that they can deliver the right kind of instruction with the right type of practice that will eliminate the fluency bottleneck and actually give students access to skilled reading comprehension so they're more likely to spend time reading and they get to access all of the good things that come from that. Thank you again, Stephanie, for that um, recording because I think you you say it so well. So. What is at part of it, what's at heart of what Stephanie was just telling us is that practice exists on a continuum and that some students need a few trials, some students need many more, and that it's the data that helps us make that decision. We also need tools that help us adjust to that amount of practice that students need. And that was part of what Cheryl and I were attempting to do when we designed uh, Sortigories. Part of what is foundational to Sortigories and to the goals that we have is a phonics scope and sequence that is uh, used across all of the activities. And what you're seeing here on the screen um, on the left is the level uh, level A scope and sequence. And on the other side, so it's a little larger to see, it's the module one slice of that. So you can see exactly the content. What's important about our scope and sequence, or actually anybody's scope and sequence, should be that it's it's the building block. So if we're talking about particular sound to spelling correspondences, those then become the sounds and spellings that we use to build the words that we want the students to be reading and practicing, whether it's for encoding or decoding, the words that we can read then become part of phrases. And it's that cumulative building using the content, namely the sounds and spellings they know that we are trying to, um, to leverage here. Now, 
what our experience, Cheryl's and my experience had been, was that a lot of practice centered around reading, practicing words in isolation. And there's nothing bad about that. In fact, being accurate and automatic with words in, in individually is essential, but that's not the end of the story. Um, and so what we did in our experience with language and beyond language was that we also um, would work on decodable text. And that particularly for older students can be harder to accomplish because of the type of text that it ends up being, but it's still practice. But our goal was to provide something that filled the space between individual words and connected text, decodable text, but still using the sound to spelling correspondences that are in that scope and sequence. So we also had, and just to go back here, the nature of these activities were also designed to do something else. And that was to work on the words across multiple elements of what we call structured literacy. So if we we turned that concept into what we're calling a word knowledge network, which mainly is displaying the multiple elements of structured literacy from phonology to sound uh, symbol, syllables, semantics, morphology, and syntax. But what we're doing that we think is somewhat unique is we're saying that we can take some words and, and not we don't do this with every single word, but we use the, the phonics code to work our way around this. So let me illustrate. So if I said the sounds k -ast, then that would be hearing, that's what the slash marks mean. I'm hearing those sounds and we're now in the phonology domain. But when I associate the k -ast with the letters that represent it, C-A-S-T, we've moved into phonics, that sound to spelling. We have also kept, and Cheryl made reference to syllables a moment ago, we have also kept in this um, display or in this uh, graphic syllable units because as soon as students become automatic with the these little words, we want them to understand that those little clusters that they can read accurately become can become part of longer words like castaway or recasting. In other words, I can begin to look for not just the individual letters, but I can look for these larger chunks, which increases fluency. Um, then the next coming around the circle is we talk about semantics. Not only do I want to say this word accurately and automatically, but I want to then associate, well, what does that mean? And if we think about it, just if you're off the top of your head, you probably say, well, does she mean cast the, the piece of bandage, stiff bandage you put on a broken bone? Or is that the group of people who put on a play or in a movie? Um, or if you happen to be a fisher person, um, is it what you do to throw the line out? Or if you're sort of li um, literary is like to cast a spell. Um, so, you know, the meaning of cast isn't singular, isn't just one. And we want students to not only know that words have multiple meanings, but learn those meanings, even with the easiest of words, sim the smallest of words. Then there's another layer, which is morphology. And in at least levels A and B of sortigories, we focus in terms of morphology, which are meaning units that can affect the meaning of words. We are focusing on uh, that group called inflectional endings, the S, E, D, I, N, G, that change the number, the tense of words. Um, and that often, especially for our multi-language learners, can be a real conundrum because they will gloss over those because they're not picking up on those subtle distinctions, but they're very much uh, carry uh, meaning carrying distinctions. And then the last uh, part of our uh, wheel is uh, syntax, which is really how some of these other parts become meaningful, which is we have to get words into a context, be it a phrase or a sentence or a paragraph, in order to know which meaning are we really talking about. So while that we've gone in clockwise direction, to some extent, we're, what we're also emphasizing here is that there's a kind of reverse impact that is important to keep in mind that 
if we do know the meaning of a word, when I'm trying to sound it out, I'm more apt to, to set for variability. Like if I kind of know it, then it's more apt to, to decode it more accurately. So that is our foundational um, graphic uh, for the concept of sortigories. So translating that wheel, uh, we have uh, nine activities. Um, they're organized in three rows. The first row um, focuses on decoding and encoding. Um, there are three um, activities, as you see, and they uh, they build from the first one sound match to build it. There's they become increasingly more more difficult, and we'll take a look at at these uh, in a moment. The second row takes words that can be decoded from that first row, and now we're talking about um, vocabulary or meaning, and related talks about relationships like antonyms, synonyms, examples, non-examples. Categorize it looks at the relationship of words that are grouped semantically, words that go together for a reason, like vehicles or things that are green. And then analogies is where we put all of that together and have children doing, uh, or adults, if that happens to be the case, um, be doing word puzzles that where the answers are the decodable words. And then uh, the last row is vocabulary and context. And um, I mentioned a second ago that knowing the morphological endings is going to impact how we understand when we put words together into a text. We do grammar sort where we're trying to have students begin to learn how words or groups of words answer meaningful questions. And we'll look at some examples of that. And the last activity in level A is phrase building where students now take the words they can decode, arrange them into a phrase that we dictate, and then identify the grammatical question that those are answering. So by the time we do this, we have gone from sound to syntax um, in every module of our program. And the other thing I just wanna highlight is that um, by doing all of these activities uh, for beginning readers, however old the beginning reader or however young the beginning reader is, um, we are covering both the word recognition of the reading rope as well as we're starting to work on the language comprehension. And you can sort of see, hopefully, um, how that is happening. Our experience with language, which led to some of this product, was that we were really emphasizing, I never want to say overemphasizing, but sort of exclusively emphasizing a lot of the code-based work. And we wanted to be sure that we were getting to those other layers that Stephanie mentioned earlier. So. Um, so Cheryl, you want to pick up here with the guide to instruction? I can't hear you. Cheryl, we can't hear you. I muted myself for a second. We would like to, um, we would like the students, adult learners, to understand that you can use the word knowledge network that Nancy just talked about through the lens of assessment so that you can learn more about the students, where they are, and how to go about teaching them. So click again, please. Mm -hmm. So we can follow the assessment, then do some instruction, and then get feedback after the practice and repeat so until we've hit mastery, it's that cyclical experience we want. And we know that, as Nancy mentioned, some kids need lots of practice. And that loop is going to happen several times where some kids do not need as much practice. The other thing is our three rows, it's possible that students could need more practice, for example, in row one, but less practice in rows two and three, or vice versa, depending on their um, patterns of strengths and weaknesses. So we really want this to be flexible and we would like teachers to be trained in a way so that they can be diagnostic and use sortigories or anything they have in front of them in a prescriptive manner. So this is really what we're trying to get at when we do professional development with teachers. We want to teach teachers how to be prescriptive using sortigories or whatever tools they have in front of them to be um, diagnostic and make best use of our intervention time. 
So for example, here's an, uh, we have um, in sort of grades, we have a placement test where the, the teacher or parent in this case will give a student a spelling inventory. And here are, if you click one more time, Nancy, so I can remember the scenario of this child. Uh, one more, sorry. Okay, this was my fourth grader. I sometimes forget the ages of the students. So this was a fourth grade student. Um, this one wasn't a parent, the next one is. This was a fourth grade student who moved in at the, la um, at the end of the school year last year and had an IEP and we had six weeks left and what was the best possible thing we could do with the student gave a quick spelling inventory and learned a lot just in a short amount of time. So you can see what the student wrote, you can see what the target words were. And then from there with students after instruction, we could have some conversation about, okay, what does the student know? What don't they know? What might, what type of instruction might the student have been exposed to um, based on the fact that they do seem to have some um, high frequency words, maybe they were more on the memorizing, it's hard to tell, but they definitely are going to need some instruction and practice in segmentation of CBC words with short A. Um, and it, based on this criteria, based on this assessment, the Sortigori's directions would um, suggest that they start at the beginning of, of A1, right from the beginning and do probably all three rows Row two and row three needs more additional information besides spelling. So I I would dig into that student's move-in information and find out where she is in language. And I just happened to know that she needed more instruction. So she would start in the very beginning um, of sortigories. Any questions there on how we might use a diet, a spelling test or a spelling placement in this manner? Jump in if you have questions or thoughts. I just wanted to make a comment that I think we also are encouraging teachers to think of data broadly, that it's not just a test score. Right. Um, and so I, I think that what we're also trying to point out is to pay attention to um, the errors as a way to know where you might need to do instruction as well. All of that requires teacher knowledge, of course. For sure. Okay. So with what you so you saw like an error analysis and where you would start a student and we're saying, well, you would start this student in row one, they would start in decoding. Well, one way to use this with students might be to use, start with our website. Our website is also educative. So there's many tabs you can select on our website to learn more about the science of reading. In particular, you can learn about sortigories and actually try it. So one of the ideas that we have for you for students would be to have them do the act activities, right? So there's one way of doing it, which is on our website. So Nancy, will you click on a closer look and get us into the website? Sure. So this is the closer look page. If you'll just scroll down and it gives you an idea. This is an introductory introductory video. This is this this particular um, slide is more about motivation and how they will feed cats and dogs. Um, and then eventually we donate to rescue animals. And then this is the feedback that they get. So that's the motivational piece to get to get kids going. We can also go into a try it situation. So if you go into try it and it's for A and B, but we'll go into A and you can select any activity in the first row that you want to try. And this is just a short example, not the whole program. Map it focuses on the segmentation, deletion and substitution of sounds in words. In the first task of Map It, identify or segment each sound in a word. In the second task, remove or delete a sound to change a word. In the third task, change or manipulate a sound to create a new word. Click here to see how the heart lets you know the part that is tricky. Before you try it, click here to see an example. And then we also have the help 
uh, section. Did you want me to do any of that, Cheryl, or do you want me to just go? Yeah, to the show them the help just so they can see it because that is the part. That's where the teachers are going to learn. Mm -hmm. So, if you chose, if we choose one of these words like this one, the letter A spells a uh in was, and the point is the heart is red because the letter A would normally be a. Uh, and what makes this unusual is that it's a, uh, and it's always that way. So it has a red heart. But if we did the letters TH spell th, and the letter E spells a uh, in the. And the difference here is the yellow heart is telling us how to, to say the sound TH, because in level A, we don't cover TH. So this is a, something they won't know based on the scope and sequence. But in level B, they do learn that. And then the yellow heart goes away. But the E in the is always going to be red because the E never changes. It's going to be a. Uh, so, all right. So, Cheryl, do you want me to show the activity itself? The word is his. And the task is to click a box for each sound, is, and then we submit. His. Is. His. Okay. The word is flag. Actually, I'm going to get that wrong so you see what happens. Oops. Click try again. So it was not the right answer. The word is flag. Still don't get it because I think it's full ag. Not quite. Flag has four sounds spelled with four letters. Flag. Flag. The word is was. We already saw that. Was. 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 The word is print. Oops. Click try again. The word is print. Now I think that blends are one sound, and so not get quite wrong again. Print has five sounds spelled with five letters. P -r -i -n -t. Print. Okay, so I think Cheryl, in the interest of our timing here, we should probably go back to some another activity. So what we want students to learn there is how it works and then why those answers are incorrect. So if you can show the next slide, Nancy. Yep, I hope. Having trouble seeing this now. Here we go. So we're getting questions um, that are coming in via email, more than social media, but some during email. And here's a question from a, 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 an adult she happens to be a uh, teacher of English learners. And she was like, I don't know. I went to map it and the word was for, but what about F-O-U-R? So she wasn't understanding that we're talking about the sounds here and not the spelling. So that was just one example. And she she color coded what she thought it would be. So I, I just sent you my response. I didn't share her whole email. Um, so that was one example of something that we would want adult learners to know. and and. I give her a lot of credit for like going through it herself to see what does she know and what she doesn't know, right? Uh, another uh, teacher came and she asked about the sound for X. Well, is it always two sounds? This was like new learning for her. And so why, why this and why that, right? So she was trying to figure it out. So I, my, my email responses are a little bit different, but I posted these on social media, mostly because I want people to know like, hey, People are learning here and you can learn too. And here's some questions that are coming up. So I really give, I really appreciate the people that are vulnerable to, 
vulnerable enough to ask the questions because some teachers just feel like, hey, I should know this, but I don't. And they feel, might feel a little embarrassed. So I think it's, I give them a lot of credit, but we really want teachers coming out of college understanding this. Here's another one that has to do with just a, a concept question, like, well, what is the difference between segmenting and blending? So I was able to use sort of, this was a, a different question on a, on a website, but I was able to use sort of gories to show, well, this one is segmenting and this one is blending and this is what they're used for. You can click again, Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, so, we, you know, showing these two examples, yes, we can tell them what it is, but actually showing the activities of what it is so they can see the difference, I think is, is really good. Um, Lisa's asking a question under try it. Are you able to practice each activity? Yes, you are. And there's like three or four of each of them. Um, we tr it's a sampling, it's not all 10, but it is a pretty good sampling. Um, and for you, I pr I'm pretty sure at the end we have access for you all. So you have the whole thing. And you would have to, we'll get into that at the end too, but you'd have to decide, well, I'll hold, but for students, you might want them to have the whole thing as well. And we'll, I'll hold that part. Okay, thanks for the question. So sure. in our, sorry, is this me, Nance? Mm -hmm. In our, um, right now we're in development. This isn't published yet, but it's coming attraction. We mm -hmm. have, this is an example of our help menu, okay? So in this case, students might not know what a syllable is. Adults might not know what a syllable is. So here is our attempt Select to teach that. Select an option. That. What is a syllable? Syllable meanings, longer words, vowel sounds. So shall we do what is a syllable for initial? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. What is a syllable? A syllable is a word or part of a word with one vowel sound. Cat has one vowel letter, which indicates one syllable or beat. Each time we see a vowel spelling in a word, it indicates there is another syllable. In this word, we see two vowel spellings indicating two syllables or two beats. Each vowel is closed off by a consonant making the vowel sound short. Cat, nap, catnap. In this word, we see two vowel spellings indicating two syllables or two beats. The first vowel is closed off by a consonant, making the vowel sound short. The second vowel is a final silent E spelling. The vowel sound is its letter name. Cup, cake cupcake. In this word, we see two vowel spellings indicating two syllables or two beats. Each syllable ends with a vowel. The vowel sound is long. The long vowel sound is its letter name. Hey, low, halo. In this word, we see four vowel spellings indicating four syllables or four beats. In the first syllable, the first vowel is closed off by a consonant, making the vowel sound short, cat. In the second syllable, the vowel spelling is er. When r comes after the vowel, the vowel is controlled by r. The sound is er. In the third syllable, the vowel is closed off by a consonant, making the vowel sound short pill. In the fourth syllable, the vowel spelling is AR. When A is followed by the letter R, the sound is R. Lar. Cat. Er. Pill. Lar. Caterpillar. Say something. So that's an example of the help. Um, thank you, Stephanie. So much information, right? Teachers don't know how to teach this. And when we talk about syllables, you know, there's a lot out there about, you know, over teaching syllable types and getting kind of hung up on the labels. So we try to thread that needle so that we don't get hung up on memorizing syllable types, but More can you understand vowels. the 
The visual Each vowel letter of a word can spell several sounds. I'm sorry, Cheryl, click a vowel that to learn its sounds. That's all right. That's all right. So, so in this screen, if you were thinking as you watch the syllables, wow, there are some things you might not know. Um, if we go select a vowel spelling, notice do... that the position of the vowel helps us to know what sound to say. And without drilling down into each one of these, but if we click on any of these and you could zero in on the particular sound spelling uh, pattern that you're you're needing to focus on, you can watch the explanation for, e for each one of those. So there's a lot of information, keeping in mind that this is coming in now in level B and after they've been exposed to these um, different sounds. So it's not like all of a sudden they have all of this information. So we probably ought to go back. Let me get out of this. And then um, I think we were gonna show the other one, which I just did. So we just went through that. So Cheryl, how about that? So I, we have another idea for you and um, timely in that we applied for the um, state approval in Virginia for the uh, Virginia Literacy Act. And you might wonder, well, what does that have to do with higher ed? I think it was a really good um, activity for us to see if we met criteria. And when I think about that, I think about what does that criteria look like? And would it be helpful for students to learn criteria from a state, a, a state adoption, if you will, any state, like what are they looking for? And if you were to apply the criteria of Virginia or Colorado or something to a product, can you, after all this learning, can you um, rate something critically to see if it, if it met? For example, Phonics and word analysis, we got 22 out of 24 points because the screen you saw before wasn't done, right? So we had syllable activities in there, but we did not, They were the reviewers were absolutely correct. We did not teach it explicitly. Now, of course, it's finished and we can't resubmit it because those are the rules and that's all fine. But would your students notice that Oh, yes, they have activities with multisyllabic words, but the comments, rightfully so, and, and the reviewers were that we did not teach syllable types or syllabic, they weren't asking us to teach syllable types because that one way was we could teach syllable types, but did you explicitly teach how to decode longer words? And we lost points because we didn't, and they were correct. My point in sharing this with you through this lens is after learning, could this be a, a, a culminating project for students to actually go through it? And if it's too much of a lift, which it might be depending on the level of your students, could they do it together? Could you walk through as, a, as, a, as an instructor one strand at a time? Now let's, I mean, just to look at, we didn't apply for vocabulary we didn't apply for fluency. Honestly, we ran out of time. But if you looked at each of those strands it for the um, for this particular um, proposal, it was rigorous. And would students know what it means, what what that criteria means, and how to look for it in products? Thankfully, they don't have to write the product. That's our job. But we just I'm offering that up as another way to do something in a college setting that is very applicable to the work later and that will help them be um, consumers of, of literacy products, which is really important. This is just another example in the supplemental space um, at different grade levels. And in this particular situation, um, we lost points for the same reasons, but you, it was comparing it to grade level standards because now you're in the supplemental space. The other one was the intervention space, right? So you could do that with a tier one product. Um, you could do that with any products, not specific to sortigories. What product, maybe they work in groups and they have different products that maybe publishers will provide for the students um, it, for free or for a limited price. So just an idea for you. I think this was a really good um, activity on our in our um, department to evaluate our own product. And that made me think about students as well. Any questions or thoughts before we move on? Okay. So are you doing this, Cheryl? 
Doesn't yes. matter. You, I no, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay. This one you so, love this example. So staying with the idea of um, diagnostics and using spelling, right? This one is a parent. This one is a kin. Uh, a uh, parent, will you click one more time? I think they're entering kindergarten. Okay. Oh, it's a right. So it is. They're entering first grade. Okay. So they're entering first grade. And mom, mom wrote and said, oh my gosh, I'm not sure about his spelling. He seems to be a good reader, but he can't spell. And what's the problem here? So the word was third. And I loved third so much because it seemed like, okay. Maybe he was using some semantics there to throw a three in there because in the, and I'm not showing you the whole spelling test, but there's nothing in the spelling that indicates that this child has confusion between numbers and letters. There's just nothing to indicate that. But, and the other thing is because the mom told me how I wasn't there. The mom told me how the student did. He wrote that with confidence. He like, I got this one. And he wrote it down. Like he was really celebrating. And I think that he was so confident because he knew the meaning that's my, my impression. But when we look later into the test, he has confus confusion about TH as he spells trunk, but he's a rising first grader. So when you take this into a, a, a college setting, I would want to know, okay, let's look at the standards. Let's not, is, is, should this mom be worried? That would be a question we might, I told the mom not to worry, but should be, should they be worried based on the standards? What, what advice would you give this mom? Um, is it is it a spelling problem? Is it a semantic problem? Where, where do you go from here? So from a sort of lens, where would we go? We would die, we would review the diagraph of TH and he wouldn't start, he wouldn't have to start in the beginning. But he could, but he wouldn't have to. And now we'll get more into vocabulary. And I don't know that we have time to do the triads, Nancy. We could repeat kind of the same um, yeah. scenario. Yeah, the only thing that perhaps we'd like to show you, if I go to um, categorize, oh, categorize it, yeah. Um, I don't. We won't show you the whole activity, but we have to do, get started. First, an important question. This is that motivator, Cheryl mentioned cats. earlier. Um, now it's your turn. Put each word in the correct category. Now, one, two things that I would like to point out while we're in here, and that is. Any words that are beyond the scope and sequence that students can decode, we have an audio that reads that to them. Buildings. And then. Materials. Sounds. Words that are to be sorted follow the scope and sequence, and we do expect the students to be able to read those accurately. That's the point of the practice. But we've also um, built in glossaries. Select a word to see and hear the definition. So going back to some students may able be able to uh, brick, a hard block used to build, may be able to read the word, but may not know what the word means. Therefore, they would be at a loss to know how to sort this word. But once we go through the glossary, and depending on the population, the teacher might want to do that with first and then have the students sort. Um, wouldn't hurt to practice that first or review that first, but that is one of the types of help that we have. And I want to point that out because we felt it was important to provide that kind of um, point of use support for students. Um, so I do think we should keep moving in the interest of time, unless there are some questions. Stephanie, are, is there anything that you're remembering that we should be mentioning? I don't think so. I think you're covering it. Okay, good. All right. And so that's that rope. And then um, again, we can look at students' work uh, products to get clues about where they're confused with things like morphology. So there are a couple of examples. Um, teens say save, save too much space. Anyway, I can't read this as under the, the thing, but this is an error, um, and many students start using apostrophes like uh, decorations um, once they know that there is such a thing, but it may, they don't necessarily know how to use it correctly, and that is a morphological element that we work on in sortigories. Um, in this example, um, the student has used the incorrect um, ending on the word depress, and uh, 
that is another morphological, it's a small difference, but it makes a big difference in terms of the meaning. So we want students to pay attention to that kind of element. And that's what we work on in, in uh, sort of gories. And then also um, in that last row of our activities, um, we have work on syntax, as we mentioned. And this also helps with that point that we were making at the beginning of that the going around the word knowledge network work goes in both directions like this uh is it was a as the it as the blue says here it was an essay uh writing process project and the students were to write about the parents giving away the family dog i can't imagine um and the students now says every every sense i have smile so they're confusing similar sounding words. Uh, we might need to back up to clarify the meaning of words, um, but we don't really know how confused they are until we're in this context. They might read every and ever just fine, but it isn't until they're now in using this that they may not have the meanings of those straight. And part of this might be backing up to segmenting and being sure they are hearing all the sounds in that word. We could go on, but part of the point is that we do want teachers to be able to be diagnostic when they look at um, student work samples. So this last row is dealing with some of these features. And I just want to show um, uh, the more sort help because I think it gets at something helpful first an important question dog Mom. cats now it's your turn okay put each word in the correct category so what we're doing in the help here is not a glossary but what's the difference between ownership and more than one because those are the sort categories and if i click on ownership ownership means belongs to adding apostrophe s to a namer makes it possessive which means it belongs to that namer. The cat's treat is a fish. The cat owns the fish. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. <clears throat> and then we can contrast that with more than one. Adding S to a namer makes it plural, which means more than one. So that student's work that we saw where they had the apostrophe after the S on teens might need to understand, understand this. So we built in help so that not only the students, but in some cases, the teachers, Cheryl puts it so well that the teachers sometimes want to know how to say it simply and accurately. They need the language, and we hope that we are providing that for, for teachers as well as the students. And then we would sort the words accordingly. Um, so I'm just not sure where to go in the time that we have here. Um, let's see, what do you think, Cheryl? Um, we do in the same menu that we were talking about, we talk about syllable meanings because we want students to, as part of breaking up longer words, look for suffixes or prefixes to help them chunk the words and that though they get an added bonus with that because they will uh, get to meaning as well as just decoding the word and we'll keep going. I did wanna contrast um, or go to the last activity in row, in row three, which is phrase building, where we dictate a phrase and students build it. And then we ask them the question, um, what does that phrase answer in a sentence? So did it answer who did it, what did it, or did what? In level B, we grow this idea up. So just so you know, there is not only um, a progression of phonics scope and sequence, but there's also a, a broader, a bigger scope and sequence. Um, and that is by level B, we're giving the students a sentence. And, you know, we often say to kids, read read in phrases or read with, with prosody or read with meaning. And the kids are, you know, looking like deer in the headlight because they don't know how to do that. So what we're trying to do is show the students where the meaning units are. And let's just look at an example quickly here. Let me skip that. First, an important question. This is built into the sauce here. 
what word or phrase answers did what? So in level A, we will have taught this, but just because we didn't look at that, I'll show it to you here. If I don't know what that answers, I could click on did what? Did what? Did what tells us the action, the thing, or object did. The dog ran. Did what? It ran. And keeping in mind, we've been building up this knowledge through all of level A, and now we're into level B. <clears throat> and so if I now ask the question, which part that's underlined in this sentence answers did what, I would click on the part and then submit that answer and so on. That's part one. In part two of um, sentence fluency in level B, we now are taking this to the grant, what we are calling our grand finale. Um, and first, an important question. Dogs are. Read the sentences, then click on a tile that tells who or what the three sentences are about. And what we're getting at here is that if through that grammar sort and this emphasis on syntax, we have students focusing on who or what did something, then we can leverage that to help kids with the following. The topic is what all of the sentences are about. The topic is a word or substitute that is repeated. Birds make nests. They are made of twigs and sticks. Nests hold eggs. The topic of these sentences is nests. They is a substitute for nests. A repeated word is another way to identify the topic. So we're really building and using that syntactic knowledge, grammatical and syntactic knowledge, to help us comprehend multiple sentences and informational text. And this is um, where we are taking the last activity uh, in sortigories. So um, let me just move us forward one more slide. So Cheryl, you wanna talk through this or? We, oh, I can. We thought- Sorry, we they're mowing grass next door. So I keep muting myself. <laughs> We can't hear you. Of this. Um, we talked about a couple ideas, sprinkled them through, but we thought you could um, assign sortigories as a component for teachers to learn content. So one of the ideas for that might be you're teaching the content, but how do you apply it? Then the students would actually use sortigories to apply the content. And in this case, for teaching it, you could use the website and just do a couple things as a kind of an I do, we do, you do. But for the students, I'd have them go through the entire thing like a course. And then after each um, activity, there's a printout page. You could have them send you the screenshots to see how they did as an accountability piece. You could do the report at the end, but I would want the actual screenshots of each activity. They can try it more than once and give you their best score. It isn't about um, getting them, it isn't about, it's not a gotcha situation. You want them to do it until they get it right. So I don't, I wouldn't have a problem with them doing it as many times as they need to do to learn it. Um, but you could definitely use it in a practicum for pre-service teachers to interact with students. So if you have students that you're working with or they're doing preclinical hours that they could use sortigories with, with them as well and see how are the re students responding? How are you gonna respond as a student to their response? Um, you could also teach how to use sortigories to differentiate instruction. And that's really hard for teachers um, to learn. And sometimes differentiation is seemingly impossible. Um, and it, there is a way to use sortigory so that it's not so difficult because everything is, is prepared uh, for the, the teachers and the students, actually. Um, we would love to, depending on your, your reach, we would love this to be considered for a research focus for graduate work, either case studies or research, or even to, to measure student growth or to measure uh, adult growth in terms of this is what they knew before they started sortigories and this is what they knew after sortigories. So they're taking any type of pre-post test. 
um, that would be really interesting as well. We welcome your ideas as you're listening. Um, I know some people had, Bethany had to leave, but if you have any other ideas um, on how this might be used or how it is used, uh, we, we welcome that. And with that, we... Oh, yeah, let's hear from Louisa. Nancy, it's just so great the way you and Cheryl have integrated these layers of language into all of these activities. So it's just so much more than basic decoding. And that's exactly what we've always needed, not to have this artificial separation um, among the aspects of language that kids need to know. And it's just so beautiful what you've done. Oh, thank you, Louisa. Nancy, you can imagine that both of us having worked with Louisa took that to heart. That was quite. Oh, agreed. And how would this apply to students learning? It, again, it goes back to evaluating uh, products and, and things that they could be using in their classroom or they might see in classrooms as they're doing preclinical hours. Are they finding that an intervention or supplemental, they're only on phonics regardless of what the students need? Are they only on phonemic awareness without letters? Like, are they, this is just a snapshot, but hopefully I'm sure that you're already introducing the work of Louisa Motes. If this is just an example of how she evaluates sortigories based on teaching all the layers of language. So that was our other reason for putting it in here. And what does this offer, Cheryl? So um, when, Na when Nancy talked about the Word Knowledge Network in the beginning, it's noteworthy to say that CORE is using the Word Knowledge Network with their adult learners in their professional development. On our website, there is a Word Knowledge Network section that can be used. There's a one-page handout that can be used. There's this printout that can be used in coursework. In addition to that, um, there's a free a trial that we invite you to engage in. And I think that website is cut off. Yeah, I guess that got dipped down a little bit too far. I'll see if I can get you the real link. Um, so that got cut off. But yeah. um, we welcome that um, so that you can use the whole thing. What would students do? I would I would have them use sortigories as a textbook. And maybe they only need it for one month. That would be the cheapest textbook they ever, ever ordered because it would be $15. But maybe to finish it, they need two months, right? So it's like, how long do they need sortigories to do their assignment? And then they could end their, their subscription. So that would be another way um, to use sortigories to actually have um, students trying it. I'm going to put the the link for the free trial in the chat because it got cut off on this slide. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah, I think one of the ways that I think the kind of an overarching concept here with sortigories is that, and using it with with teachers in training, whatever the level is, is that it's trying to bring the science of reading, what we know and should be doing or recommend to some, a way to do it, to actually be able to implement it. And um, what we didn't do today, but what Cheryl and I have done is that once you have done some of the activities, you can apply that when students are reading decodable text or they're reading something in a book, you can do all of these activities um, once with that other text material. It doesn't just have to be within um, our particular items in our app. Um, so we found that to be another way to help teachers um, apply the science to their work. So with that, we say thank you. And thank you, Stephanie. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. Thank you so much. Couple questions in the chat. I wanna make sure we address, uh, can students pre-service teacher students get access to a free trial? You know, we haven't, We Nancy and I would have to talk about that a little bit more. We haven't done that um, at this point for pre-service teachers. We've been doing, being pretty selective about how we use the free trial, but let me just say maybe and let Nancy and I consider that. Yeah, and uh, the other question was, have you considered anything like a subscription for a training program? So it would be 
uh, mm -hmm. not the individual teacher candidates are paying for a subscription, mm -hmm. but there might be a rate that you offer in a in an agreement with the training program. And then they have, I don't know, 25 licenses for uh, some limited period of time or something like that. Just another idea that Bethany was asking about. You know, that's a great idea. It kind of reminds me of the tutoring, how the tutoring came about, right? So they're using um, high dosage tutoring. So we have a plan on our website that allows up to 10 people to use um, the act, whether it's either monthly or yearly. So that's how that pricing came to be. So we're really open to creative pricing on things like that. Um, we had another situation where you had 50 tutors use it in, in Canada um, for just a month because they just wanted to try it at the end of last year and, and see what how that worked with 50 tutors. So yeah, we're really open to different pricing configurations. Um, as a startup, we just have to be a little bit careful about the freebies, um, but we're open to really open to creative pricing. That's for sure. Awesome. And we don't, we haven't, as to that point, we don't know all the conditions under which sort of categories might make sense to be used. So we have to, you know, think flexibly and creatively as these new situations come up. We keep thinking there's increasingly there's value for the teachers. And um, I think that if we can figure out a way to get this to, into teachers' hands to learn themselves, mm -hmm. that we have done something important here. We'd like to think so anyway. Yeah, I'm imagining a um, a win-win scenario where you might have a professor who's interested in doing some research on the product in exchange for uh, perhaps you know having some licenses for, for sure. their students to use it or something like that. So yeah, you're getting our wheels spinning here. So. Which yeah. is good. And there is a, quite a bit of material for free on our website. And not only the try yes. it, but there's background on each activity and the science behind each activity. Mm -hmm. um, when you learn more uh, under a closer look and there's videos for each activity mm -hmm. and there's a try it. So I feel like there's a lot already. That's why the website was created the way it was created. It was created to be educative in nature because we were giving so much of our product away for free. And I was like, we, there needs to be a balance, but we want to, we want to be part of the solution too. Right. So we tried to put as much on our website for free as we could in terms of learning and trying, but yeah, any type of win-win situations that we can create in a, in a meaningful way, we really do want to be in a space where we can give back. Uh, we want teachers to learn and we want teachers to come out of university situations um, equipped to, to handle the device, di diverse learners that we have today in front of us, right? Absolutely. Well, I know, um, thank, I, I wanna thank you for the information today. And I was gonna say, I know that more people will watch this recording. Um, so we will stay in touch about the the sort of ideas that people have about using this within their courses and their field experiences. So I, I appreciate you being open uh, and willing to, to have this sort of extension of what you originally created the, the product for, because I think it has lots of application here. So thank you both so much. I appreciate thank your time you. and um, we will definitely stay in touch about this. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.